So I just got done watching the last video, which was pretty awful, but I think that this one is going to be quite a bit better. So this one's on lecture notes 11, which is an intro to discrete probability. So I want to again start by uh, motivating this with an example. Let's say we're flipping four coins and we want to know the probability of getting exactly two heads. So the answer to this is the number of possibilities of flipping two coins with exactly two heads divided by the number of total possibilities of flipping two coins. And we know from the previous lecture that the top part of this equation is just four choose two. And we also know that the bottom part of this equation is two to the four because that's uh, the total number of ways that we can flip two coins each time we have two choices. Uh, that's the first rule of counting. So we know this, uh, this to be equal to 6 over 16, which is 3 over 8. But let's actually, for the rest of the lecture, kind of break down exactly what we did there and formalize all of the, the sort of intuitively obvious stuff that we just did. But it won't be so obvious how to, how to apply it in some harder examples. So let's start by saying we have a finite set u which holds uh, the possible results of taking certain types of actions. Uh, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, so let's actually give some examples of use. So if you are tossing coins, U would be equal to a set of heads and tails. So that's like if you were tossing a single coin, what, what are the possible outcomes? Or in general for tossing coins, the set of possible outcomes uh, come from this set U, heads and tails. And if you're um, pulling cards, then U equals uh, the set of all 52 cards. So the set of all 52 cards. OK, so we have this U. So now let's define another thing. We're going to have a lot of definitions for the next little while but they're needed to uh, sort of give a clear way of solving all these uh, problems. So let's define an experiment. Oops, don't know how to spell. To be sampling k elements from u. Now this can be either sampling with replacement or without replacement. And if you remember from the last lecture, replacement is basically you, you replace all the elements of U back into U after picking out one of them. And without replacement is you pull one out, and then it's essentially no longer in the set of possible outcomes for the next uh, whatever turns. So now let's define another thing which we call a sample point. Now, this sample point is some is a single outcome of an experiment of the experiment. It's an actual outcome. Uh, so let's give an example where we show both of these. Let's let's use that example of uh, flipping coins. Uh, coins. So uh, the, ex the experiment, let's say we're flipping two coins, right? Our experiment, which is flip two coins, can be thought of as sampling two from U, which we know is heads, tails. OK? So, and now a potential sample point, an example of a sample point, would be heads, tails, which is a possible result of flipping the two coins. Now, another definition. 
that we're going to give is called the sample space, which is denoted with omega. So the sample space is the set of all sample points. Of all Uh, which is basically the same thing as the set of all possible outcomes. So uh, let's go back to that example where we're flipping two coins. Uh, and let's show that, so omega, ugly, uh, is equal to the set containing Heads, tails, uh, heads, heads, tails, tails, and tails, heads. S these are all the possible uh, results of the coin flip. So they, these are all the sample points, and basically they, the set of all, all, of all possibilities makes up the sample space. Now let's call each of these members of, uh, of capital omega, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, and omega 4. So here, uh, a thing to notice is that the cardinality, which is the size of the set big omega, uh, is equal to 4, which also happens to be equal to the cardinality of u, which again u was the set of, of possible results to any coin flip in general. The cardinality of u to the power k, which is where k was the number of times we sampled uh, from u, uh, which was 2 squared, which was equal to 4. Uh, and in general, when you're sampling with replacement, you should probably see something that looks like this. OK, let's come up with the last definition. Uh, the last thing we're going to define is a probability space. Actually, it's the second to last thing we're going to define. So a probability space is the sample space, omega, with a probability P R of little omega attached to all omega in big omega. And what this is basically saying is that not only do you get all of the members of this set omega, but you also get the probability of each of these events taking place uh, along with, with the, the, the possible result. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple constraints on, on these probabilities for, for all these possible results. And uh, the, these are that the probability of omega, of any given omega, must be between 0 and 1 for all omega in big omega. And then also, the sum of all the probabilities of all the omegas should be equal to 1. So this previous case was a pretty simple example in which the probability of all of these things happening is the same, uh, namely 1 fourth. So in this, in this case, the probability of omega, in our example, by the way, uh, the probability of omega equals 1 over 4 for all omega. And uh, this is kind of uh, the most general, simple, the most general vert, so you can generalize this to say that uh, the probability of omega equals 1 over cap n for all omega, where n is the cardinality, the size, ugly, still ugly but better, of, of the set omega, which is basically just saying 
equal, every single possible outcome is equally likely. And that's the simplest way to define uh, space. Uh, the simplest probability function across the elements in a probability space. So now we're going to define one last thing. Let's call it event A. And we say that an event A corresponds to a subset of the sample space omega. A is a subset of omega. Uh, so this can be a slightly difficult concept to wrap your head around uh, at the very beginning. So let's give a couple of examples of events. So let's frame them in English by saying the event where, and then say, let's ask for the event where you get exactly one head. So now we want to know which subset of the sample space, omega, does this correspond to. So let's go check. Uh, the elements of omega where you get exactly one heads are omega 1 and omega 4. So this, this A, this event A, corresponds to the subset of big omega that's, that contains omega 1 and omega 4. Let's come up with another event, which says the event where you get at most one tails. So what subspace subset does this correspond to? Uh, let's look again. The ones in which you get at most one tails are again omega 1. Omega 2 has no tails, so that counts. And omega 4, the only thing excluded is omega 3. So this is the subset of omega 1, omega 2, and omega 4. So an event in probability can be thought of as some of the broad sweeping sort of outcomes of your experiment. And a lot of the time what people are going to want to know is what is the probability of a certain event A occurring. Now we can break this down into a sum of the probabilities of all the individual components that comprise A, the probabilities of those occurring. Now this is a really great result because we should know from the probability space what the probability of all those omega occurring are. And now the problem of figuring out the probability of an event A occurring just becomes the problem of counting the number of omega that are in the set A. Uh, this is great because we've boiled a problem uh, that was slightly more difficult into a problem that we already know how to solve. So this leads us very naturally to this algorithm for solving probability problems that I put up on the screen, uh, where in which the first thing you do is you figure out what is the sample space. That's just figuring out what is omega, so that requires figuring out what the experiment is and all the possible outcomes to that experiment. And then you want to figure out the probability of all the sample points within omega for all omega, which are in omega. And then you have to figure out, all right, what is the event A that I'm interested in, which is going to provide us with a subset of omega. And then it's just a matter of summing up all the probabilities of these omegas in A. So we're going to show use this algorithm to solve a couple probability problems. Uh, and this should illustrate the fashion in which we should do these. Let's say that we roll two dice and we're asked the question, what is the probability that the sum of the two rolls is at least 10? So we're going to run through every single component of solving this problem in, uh, according to the algorithm. Uh, and we're going to help clarify all the definitions of all the stuff from earlier. So uh, this might be a little slow, but it'll help, help uh, sort of uh, hash out the process. So what is u? u is the set of outcomes to any role, which will be the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what is our experiment? Our experiment is sample to, from, u with replacement, because rolling dice is always with replacement. Uh, what's our event A? 
our event A is that sum is greater than or equal to 10. Okay, and what we're asked for is what is the probability of A. So we know how to find this out. Uh, first thing we do is figure out what omega is. So we know omega is the set of all tuples of i and j where i and j are between 1 and 6. So you should know that um, the probability of any particular tuple occurring is always going to be 1 in 36 because no, the occurrence of no tuple is privileged over any other two rolls. And uh, the reason that we got 36 should be obvious to you from the first video because we know that the cardinality of the set big omega should be 36 because we're rolling two die and the total number of outcomes possible is 6 squared, which is 36. So now we can say that the probability of A occurring is equal to, we, as we know the equation, uh, this probability of each of the omegas that are in A. But we know that all of the omegas in A have a probability 1 in 36 of occurring. So now we've boiled this down to the problem of figuring out the cardinality of the set A, the size of the set A, and multiplying it by 36. So essentially what we've boiled this down to is a counting problem, where the problem is how many rolls of two die have some at least 10. And as you can see, we took a problem of computing probability and turned it into a simple problem of counting, which is the reason we did counting in the first place. And uh, you can actually count the number of these on your finger, but uh, I'll just write them out explicitly for you, show you that A is um, 4, 6, 4, 5, 5, 5, 6, 6, 4, 6, 5, and 6, 6. So the cardinality of A is equal to 6, and the probability of A is therefore equal to 1 out of 6. So now, let's consider another example where we flip a biased coin three times, which two-thirds of the time it comes out as heads, and one-third of the time it comes out as hail, tails, and we ask, what is the probability of getting exactly two heads? We're going to go through this example a little quicker, but I'm still going to break down all the steps. So we know u is equal to heads and tails. These are the possibilities, the possible outcomes of, of, of the type coin flip. Uh, the experiment is to sample three from U with replacement. Uh, the event A is that the coin flips to exactly two heads out of the three. And we want to know what is the probability of A. So again, we know omega, omega is the set of all possible outcomes. Uh, I'm not going to write out all the possible outcomes. But I'm going to say that we know that the cardinality of omega is going to be equal to the cardinality of u to the power k, which is 2 cubed, which is equal to 8. Uh, now, if we want to compute the probability of a, again, let's write out the sum we want. We want the probabilities of each of the omega that are in a. And now let's think about the omega that are in a. 
So we don't actually, it's not as straightforward to compute the probability of the omegas in A because this isn't, this isn't the simplest case. So let's say without loss of generality that omega is equal to heads, heads, tails, right? So we want to figure out uh, what the probability of this omega happening is. Well, we haven't actually gone over this, uh, but, and I think that we're going to go over it more rigorously later, but uh, we know that the probability of getting heads the first time is two-thirds. The probability of getting heads the second time is two-thirds. And the probability of getting tails the, th the third time is one-thirds. So we get the probability of this happening is equal to four over nine. Now, you can't always just multiply probabilities like this. And uh, this is a bit hand wavy to just say we can do it, but I promise we'll talk about that in a little more detail later. Sorry, this is not 4 over 9. This is 4 over 27. Okay, so now we have, uh, uh, we, we did this without loss of generality, so we know what all, of the, uh, what all of the probabilities of the omegas are. So now again, we get to boil this down into a problem of figuring out the cardinality, the size of the set A, and then multiplying that by 4 over 27. So, uh, and this is, a great, this is great. This is what we've been trying to get this whole time because we know how to compute the cardinality of this set A. Uh, we learned it uh, the, in the last video. And that is just 3 choose 2, right? 3 and we want 2 heads out of those uh, multiplied by 4 over 27. Uh, and we know the, out, the answer to that is 3 times 4 over 27, which is equal to 4 over 9. So that's the probability of flipping two heads when you have a biased coin, which comes out heads two-thirds of the time. All this is chill. We've solved some problems. We've done some stuff. We've learned some things. But now let's talk about a, a few of the implications of the stuff we've learned. And I'm not going to go into as much detail about these because I think the professor will go over them in lecture. But uh, I'll just bring them up and kind of talk about them and give you stuff to look forward to. So first, let's talk about the birthday paradox, which I'm not going to prove here. But I'm just going to tell you the results. Um, and the reason it's called a paradox is, is that it, comes, it, it gives us results which uh, are counterintuitive, which, which just genuinely don't seem right. So um, let's consider, in this case, the event A to say there are at least two people in a room with the same birthday. So in general, you would think that the probability of this is pretty low. Uh, and what's paradoxical about this is that if there are n equals 23 people in a room, then the probability of A is actually greater than 50%. So uh, again, I'm not proving this, but I'm just letting you know the results. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is interesting, and this is cool. So in a room with n equals 60 people, uh, the probability that two of them have the same birthday is actually greater than 99%. So it's almost guaranteed. So the, this, you can see the reason they call this a paradox. Paradox. It's not mathematically a paradox. It's just, just confu It's just a confusing result. It's not what we expect. Uh, and then the second thing uh, is the Monty Hall problem, which I'm also not gonna go into the proof of, because it'll probably a, be a big part of what we do in lecture. But I'm also gonna sort of set the scene for what the the problem is. So suppose you're on a game show. And you are presented with three doors. Three doors. And uh, somebody says to you, uh, behind two of these doors is, uh, is a goat. And behind one of them is a brand new car. So then you pick one of the doors. Uh, 
uh, let's just say you pick this one. Uh, and uh, at, at this point in time, we know that the probability that each of these has uh, a car behind them is 1 over 3, 1 over 3, and 1 over 3. So by picking one of them, you have a one-third chance of getting a car. But these two doors together uh, have a two-third chance of getting the car, a two-by-three chance of having the car in it. So now uh, what the lovely assistant, Carol, says is, OK, one of the two, three doors, not the one you picked. Remember, you picked this one has a goat behind them. Let's just say it's this one. right? So now you know that one of the doors has a goat behind it. And then they ask you whether or not you want to switch doors. And the surprising result is every single time, you absolutely want to switch doors because these th two doors still split the probability uh, of, of 2 thirds because th they're expected they're expected to have a door with two-thirds probability. Uh, but we know that this door has zero probability of having uh, the car in it. Therefore, this door gets transferred all two-thirds of the probability. So the reason you definitely want to switch doors is because the, this other door <coughs> has double the chance of having a car behind it than the one, than the one that you picked originally. So you should always switch doors. So this was not the rigorous proof of the Monty Hall problem, but just sort of the intuitive proof for, for why this, the, the result is the case. But the good news is that now you get a new car. Uh, but as when the professor goes over the proof in class, don't feel discouraged if you get lost or kind of are not understanding the result because even uh, this guy, Paul Erdos, who was the um, most prolific mathematician of all time, uh, who wrote, uh, published over 1,500 articles, 1,525 I think to be exact, and uh, to this day, mathematicians value or it's sort of uses a barometer, people's Erdos number, which is their degree of separation from uh, Paul Erdos' uh, publishings. Uh, so, and this guy didn't actually believe uh, the results of Monty Hall, uh, of, the, of the Monty Hall problem, and actually couldn't get behind the probabilistic proof of, of Monty Hall until after he had seen a computer simulation of, of it, and he saw that the, the results, after running it a whole bunch of times, came out to uh, the expected probabilities. So uh, don't feel discouraged if you don't get it, because even this guy didn't get it.